and welcome to a brand new episode of the Musafir Stories, India's very own travel podcast, where each week we share the journey of travelers in their own words and relive their experiences with you, our listeners. Hey guys, welcome to a brand new episode of the Musafir Stories. Hope you're all well and keeping safe. On the podcast today, we travel with Upasana Kakati, a traveler and blogger who takes us to one of the most beautiful places we've covered on the podcast so far. And no, I am not exaggerating. Let's hop onto the episode and find out where Upasana is taking us to. So with that introduction, we'd love to welcome Upasana Kakati from the blog Unconventional and Vivid to the Musafir Stories. Hey Upasana, welcome to the podcast and thank you so much for coming on. Hey Seth, thank you so much for having me. I have been listening to Musafir Stories for such a long time and it's really an honor for me to be a part of your podcast. You're doing an amazing work bringing out so many stories from different parts of the country. No, thank you, Pasna. I, I keep saying this uh, every episode that it is um, completely and full credit to guests like you who are actually agreeing to come and share these wonderful stories and share this with the broader audience. Uh, otherwise, without you folks, uh, the Musafir stories would never have even started. So thank you uh, for, for agreeing to come on the podcast. Um, but before we uh, get into the specifics, so Pasna, do you also want to give a quick intro um, about yourself and the blog to, to the audience? Uh, sure. My name is Upasana Kakati. Uh, I am basically from Guwahati, but currently I'm based out of Delhi. Uh, so right now I work as a copywriter in a media firm. Uh, prior to that, I was working with Nagaland University and that's how I started traveling actually in mm-hmm. Northeast India. Uh, so I've been traveling for six years now, mostly solo. And sometimes it's just very rare that I'm traveling with my friends, but mostly I've been traveling solo. So uh, the whole purpose of starting my blog was obviously, first of all, it was my love for writing. I mean, I love writing. I love documenting stories. And, you know, uh, both I'm majorly a storyteller, so, you know, just clubbing stories from the roads. Uh, second purpose, and like, I think a very dominating purpose was uh, to actually bridge the gap between Northeast India to the rest of India. Mm-hmm. So there is so less information about uh, the places in Northeast India, except for obviously the tourist places like Tawang and Shillong. I mean, people have heard about these places, but uh, there are so many other places. People don't really have information about how to go there. People don't know really about the culture. So uh, my main goal was to you know let people know that uh, these are the places, and you know you can travel to these places. Uh, how you can travel? So yeah, basically you know uh, through the means of tourism, probably I was just trying to bridge the gap between uh, Northeast India and the rest of the India. Wonderful. I think we are blessed to have uh, natives or uh, locals from the area who are actually uh, going out of the way to do this, uh, that way spreading more awareness and also, uh, like you said, helping out a larger audience um, learn about this also, right? Because uh, mainstream media and uh, even like uh, our curriculums, uh, I mean, from an academic perspective, I know we definitely don't do justice in terms of uh, covering a lot of different parts of the country that way, right? And uh, Northeast is actually one of them. So it's great that um, you and the blog actually focuses on uh, a lot of the travel within Northeast. Um, so eagerly looking forward to um, uncovering more. And hopefully uh, from the Northeast today, we'll find out where you're taking us to. Uh, do you want to give a quick overview of the itinerary or the trip that we'll be covering on the podcast today, Upasna? Yeah, sure. Uh, so today I'm going to take you to Mishmi Hills. Mm-hmm. So uh, it's located in Divang Valley. It's a very remote corner of our country, which is in Arunachal Pradesh. When I say remote, it's actually very remote because you don't have internet connection there. Uh, there is no mobile network. I think BSNL works very faintly. So yeah, I'm going to take you on uh, a trek called a Seven Lakes Trek through Mishmi Hills in Divang Valley. Okay, wonderful. Looking forward to this. And yeah, this is, I mean, I know uh, sometimes even um, 
I personally tend to use uh, unexplored and pristine quite loosely. Like I use that to uh, cover like a lot of places or uh, describe a lot of places. But this truly is very, very unexplored, like you mentioned. And we'll see that during the course of the conversation too. Uh, in terms of getting uh, getting to, um, the, uh, let's say, the trailhead or uh, where we start this trek as well, Opasna, given that it's um, pretty, pretty, um, it's, it's not very mainstream, right? So get uh, how, how does one get there? Uh, so, uh, the base is Anini. So, there is a place called Anini in Dibang Valley. So, that is the headquarter of Dibang Valley. So, uh, let's say uh, the base point is, like the first point of journey is, let's say, Guwahati. Because uh, if people are traveling from outside, probably mm-hmm. they will end up in either Dibrugar or Guwahati. So, let's just say, uh, if people are in Guwahati, so they can take a bus. Uh, I'm just talking about like the normal local kind of journey, like, you know, not through the cabs. Right. Uh, so let's say someone wants to go to one in on their own. So uh, the first thing is either you can take a night bus to Rowing. So there's a place in Arunachal, Rowing. So that's basically almost in the border of Assam and Arunachal Pradesh. So it is well connected. So either you can take a train to Dibrugar uh, or Tinsukia and take a local bus or a uh, cab from there to Rohim or you can take a night super like night bus from Guwahati and you, it's an overnight journey and you will reach Rohim. And then there are like these shared cabs uh, which uh, fly between Rohim to Anini mm-hmm. every day at 5.30, like uh, 5.30 a.m. So it's very limited. So, you know, if you have to go from Rohim to Anini, you'll have to book the cabs in advance like a day before or like two days before or maybe like a night before Mm -hmm. and 5 30 to 6 30 these cabs leave because the road although it's like newly constructed but yet it is still under construction and again it's a mountain road and it's a remote terrain so Mm -hmm. it takes around 12 or 13 hours of journey uh let's say 10 or 12 hours depending on like the road condition so, yeah, like if you start from Guwahati, it will definitely take you two days. I mean, not less than that to reach Anini, which is like the base for starting the trek. Okay. So definitely it does require some amount of planning uh, ahead of time. It's not that yeah, uh, you just show up there and <laughs> decide to start, right? So definitely uh, make sure that you're planning. Uh, and also just because of the nature of the trek, uh, it might be ideal to work with a trekking company, right? It's not uh, something you could probably do solo yourself right no it is not recommended i mean i would not recommend anyone to take that kind of risk you know venturing into mishimi hills alone because uh, actually the landscape is very different uh, as compared to like the uttarakhand or uh, mm-hmm. the himachal mountains yep. i mean any of these people should not venture into mountains alone but that landscape is again very very different and it's highly recommended you go with a organized team like there's an organizing team in Udu Trekkers. Mm-hmm. So they have been organizing the treks uh, since a year now, I think year and a half or year. Mm-hmm. So I went with them, I think, and they are the only organizers at this moment. Yeah, I think that also speaks to the nature of the trek, right? How right. Uh, remote and offbeat this is that there isn't like, I mean, it's definitely good in one way, but um, uh, again, like I said, uh, make sure you plan ahead of time it's not that you just show up and decide to do this trek you'll need some amount of planning ahead of time um and in terms of the uh, just the overall length of the trek um Upasana, do you want to give a quick overview of um how, how long this trek is and when one should plan on doing this so it's an eight day trek uh depending on the weather conditions so for us what happened was one day the weather was very very bad mm-hmm. so we had to stay one night extra in one second camp so uh for for that reason, it took us like nine days. Otherwise, it's an eight-day trek, uh, okay. including the day you climb and coming down. It's an overall eight-day trek. And I think the best month would be during the monsoons because uh, it's a flower. It's a flowering month, so it's all mm-hmm. blooming with flowers. Uh, but if you are a bit hesitant uh, with the rain and like uh, you don't want to be like very drenched and you don't want to go into the peak monsoons, I think. Uh, Maybe like October, November uh, is a good month when it is fairly dry, although it's still raining because mm-hmm. you, know, you cross the rainforest and the terrain is such that, you know, it just keeps raining throughout the year. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I think monsoons, it will rain heavily, but also it is like the most beautiful time of the year to go and do that trek because of the flowers. Okay. But I went in the month of October, so 
it did rain a lot, but mm-hmm. uh, I'm sure it didn't rain as much as it would have been raining <laughs> in the monsoons. Okay, okay, wonderful. And just in, uh, from a perspective of the difficulty level of the trek, is uh, is this like a medium, hard? Uh, how would you categorize this? Uh, I think hard would be like something like really hard. So yeah, I think medium to uh, hard, it's yeah, some, between somewhere the between them. Yeah, so you will have to have a certain level of fitness to uh, do that trek because although you don't gain a lot of altitude, like the maximum altitude is like 14,000 feet, Mm-hmm. Uh, and that you don't stay there. It's one lake that's like 14,000 feet and you come down. But uh, the thing is the terrain is like very different because it's a very raw route and it's not very well laid like the Himalayan trek in yeah. Uttarakhand or Himachal. So since it's a very raw trek, it's like and then that landscape keeps changing every single day. So it's like you're not like just climbing, climbing and then you know coming down. It's like up, down, up, down, ascend, right. descend, ascend, descend, yeah, so it's a mix of that, so yeah, I think you need to be in proper shape and like, you know, be physically fit to do that. Yeah, yeah, definitely, uh, and in terms of uh, just um, this preparedness, right, uh, obviously being physically fit is uh, recommended, so plan and uh, ensure at least a few days before the trek you um, get to a state of physical fitness where you could uh, trek continuously or run continuously for a uh, few minutes. Uh, but uh, from a packing perspective, what would you recommend? Because again, uh, to your point, uh, the terrain is pretty uh, harsh. So uh, what would you suggest one packs or uh, yeah, carries in terms of clothing, gear, etc.? The first requirement and the most important requirement would be the gumboots. Mm-hmm. So... Uh, so I thought like, because I've done Himalayan treks before, so I was like, you know, you always go trekking using your shoes. Right. So I carried my shoes, but luckily I, I bought a pair of gumboots uh, in Anani. Mm-hmm. So, and I think that was the best thing because you need the gumboots because the terrain is very slushy. So yeah. there are these points when, you know, your leg is like literally going to go inside the mud. Mm-hmm. So the trekking shoes are not going to work at all. So gumboots are the must. And then you need to have a raincoat. So basically, I would recommend not to use a poncho. Mm-hmm. Just use like a proper raincoat. Uh, you know, it's like proper like the upper and lower uh, okay. raincoat. And then you need like a heavy jacket, like a down feather jacket. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then, you know, like a couple of like, then you need to have odomos because uh, right. while you're crossing the uh, grassland, we have this insect called as dandil. Mm. So when they bite, you don't really see them, but uh, they bite you, and then you know it's very itchy. Oh, so okay. you know you need to cover yourself up. Trekking pole is not essential because you know they they will give you bamboo poles. Mm-hmm. There are like a couple of bamboo poles that they they have in place. So you know I think uh, you should not carry a trekking pole. It's an added luggage. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, basically it's very well managed by the trekking group, right? Mo do trekkers. Wonderful. Thanks so much for uh, setting this context beautifully, um, Upasana. Now, without <laughs> much ado and uh, uh, spending any any further time, uh, let's jump onto the trek. And um, why don't you take us through this? You mentioned that it's an eight to nine day trek, depending on the uh, weather conditions. So uh, why yeah. don't you start off from uh, day one and give us a quick overview of where you started, what you're looking at day one, and the kinds of uh, sights and sounds that you pass through as you're kicking off this trek. Right. So uh, the first day, um, I think you have to leave like really early, like 7 or 8, 30. And then uh, you, with the actual trek, it starts from a village called the Indian, Indian village. Okay. So it's around a one and a half hour drive from Anini. Although mm-hmm. it's not very far, but it's the road condition that uh, the roads are not very neat. Like it's like, the mountain roads, it takes time. Mm-hmm. So, you can say like one and a half hour to two hours is the journey time from Anili to Imuru village. So, that's like the data, like the point, trekking point, the start of the trek. Okay. Uh, so, the moment you reach there, um, you have to start climbing. The first day is climbing through grassland. Mm-hmm. And uh, when I say grassland, it sounds very uh, easy, something very easy, but it's like a steep grassland. Yeah. So you'll have to, it's like a very steep grassland. So, you know, you'll have to put a lot of energy and endurance to like, you know, climb that. Uh, 
although it's 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 very exciting it's very beautiful but i think if you are late in starting the climb mm-hmm. it also gets very very hot mm-hmm. uh, although it's windy and breezy but uh, the mountain heat is very harsh the sun is very harsh so sure. it's very important that you know you're well capped and like you put your sunscreen and like you're fully covered and you put your odomos and everything and yeah so first day is like you know you have to climb through the grassland and uh, then after a point uh, like once you reach like there's a point after like one and a half hour one hour depending on one's stamina mm-hmm. uh after that it becomes sort of fairly easy because you have to like just straight walk so the initial is quite steep right so initial like one hour is quite steep after that you have to plainly walk through the grass then it's pretty plain and uh, i think after the climb is over you will transition into a rainforest. Okay. So that's just the start of the rainforest where you have the first camp. Okay. Yeah, how many how many hours of trekking are we roughly talk about on day 1? Uh so I was not in the best of my physical fitness, so it took me some time, 6 and 1/2 hours or something, but okay. if someone is physically fit, I think for them it would take like 3 and 1/2 hours or 4 hours. 4 hours, okay. Yeah, yeah. and uh, I think like I was mentioning it to you earlier right uh, one of the biggest injustice we're probably doing is uh, not uh, having like pictures or uh, a video to support this because it's so 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 beautiful uh, and i'm not at all exaggerating this when i say this it is really one of the most beautiful things i've uh, ever seen on any of the episodes i've covered on the musafir story so far and we've covered like 130 plus episodes now so that kind of speaks to it we'll definitely make sure we include um, pictures um, to to so that like listeners can go look them up but it's really really beautiful even these grasslands that you speak of uh, they're right. really serpenting and very uh, steep and i saw like a few drone shots being made uh, during the trek as well it's really marvelous um, and i completely agree to your point that uh, given that uh, one these are pretty uh, high also right they're not like uh, uh just just like an uh, ankle or knee level grass it's pretty high also uh and these uh dam dams or dam dams dam dams yeah dam dams so <laughs> yeah that plus the sun it can get a little harsh so make sure you're well prepared this um this hat that um upasna mentioned that is also like a life saver especially uh, in this early phase right obviously from the rain it protects you but even from the sun as well when it's uh, pretty hot it really protects you uh, and you might have to take the help of a mask as well just to like keep off these uh dam dams these uh and this these flies right almost black flies right. that they so tend like to small black flies and like they bite you and you don't yeah. realize when they bite you <laughs> yeah and then when the itching starts that's when you kind of realize uh, how you've been hit or what is it you um so uh, wonderful these are the emuli grasslands right uh, that we yeah. walked through the first day now talk to us about this first campsite and how your experience was there uh, the, because this is what in the rainforest you said first so it is just the beginning of the rainforest so okay. like uh, when you uh, when you are just about to reach the uh, first camp mm-hmm. so there is a slight ascent and that is when uh, the rainforest starts and okay. uh, it's quite soggy and it's all foggy and like you know it's moist because it's always raining and you know you have there's so much nature like uh, it just you feel like okay you are in like the rawest cleanest greenest part of the earth that's what you feel like at this point so yeah the first campsite is known as aniku okay so aniku means grassland there are like two options like there are tents So mm-hmm. some of the trekkers are accommodated in tents, and then also they have a logwood hut. Mm-hmm. So basically, they use that for cooking. But it's uh, it's quite spacious and it's like very nicely built. So uh, you can like there are a couple of trekkers who also sleep there once like the cooking part is over and like you know the food everyone's eaten their dinner. So okay. yeah, so there are like two options in the camp. First camp. Okay. Okay. Wonderful. So this is the Aniku campsite that you spent the first um, first night at. I'm assuming, right? You spent yes. the time there. And uh, what is the plan for uh, day two? Like, uh, what is the terrain that you are planning on trekking through? And uh, also, like, how long of a trek is this? So uh, second day is through the rainforest. So you know, you have your breakfast and you start as early as you can. 
uh, because uh, I think the second day is the easiest okay. amongst all the day. <laughs> so you just have to walk straight, straight. I mean, like it's not exactly purely straight, but yeah, it's comparatively straight. Okay, so, not too much uh, uh, not elevation too much either, like in terms of uh, yeah, no, ascent? it's not okay. too much of uh, ascent. Uh, but the thing is, it's a very very long week. Right. So you'll have to just keep walking, walking, walking. I mean, like it's. I think it takes like it took me like eight hours because I was not physically that fit. Mm-hmm. But if someone is fit, okay, they can complete that uh, rainforest trek in like uh, five hours, mm-hmm. or maybe four, four, four and a half hours, five hours, depending on their speed. Mm. So the rainforest is quite. Uh, it's beautiful, but it also becomes gloomy and monotonous at a certain point because, you know, you're just walking through the same thing for like mm-hmm. hours and then you just want to reach the second camp. <laughs> mm. Yeah, I think one of the um, very uh, differentiating things I saw compared to day one was uh, <laughs> or the overwhelming noises or the cacophony of insects around you, right? Especially in the rainforest. This is like at the peak, I think. The sound of the insects yes. is constant, right, throughout the trek. Yes. This was uh, yeah. constantly accompanying you. And, uh, uh, yeah, it, it just like it's, it's it's so different, right? I mean, it's nice. Uh, I think it's really good, like, you know, walking through there. You feel like you're in some Amazonian rainforest or <laughs> yeah. something. I mean, obviously, on a less uh, harsher way, but uh, uh, a little bit less as compared to Amazon. But... Yeah, you still feel that, like, you're very close to nature. You can, like, uh, listen to uh, the crickets and all kind of insects, uh, you know, screaming yeah. <laughs> and, like, just doing their thing. Birds and then, you know, you see this wild mushroom. And you see, like, huge mushroom throughout the entire uh, rainforest trek. Yeah, yeah. The second day. So, yeah, it's, it's really nice. Uh, if you keep observing, like, things, it's really nice. It, the motive is just to keep walking and reach the cancer it probably gets a bit monotonous but if you want to observe thing and you know just take break probably it, it, it is a good route plus yeah. it's a bit gloomy because you know it's again rainforest and it's raining and you know it's like just misty so you know you're constantly walking through that yeah yeah definitely and uh, it's also a long day of trek right so you yes. <laughs> make sure you prepare to uh, kind of absorb that in and also mentally prepare that it's a long trek uh, given that but yeah thankfully it's not too hard of a trek so that way you could uh, see through this um, and uh, what is the camp uh, at the end of this trek well, so it's probably so, like almost end of day like evening by the time you hit the campsite I'm assuming yeah I mean I reached by evening I mean there yeah. were other trekkers with it also they reached quite before like before yeah. me they reached by around like 2.30 or something but it took me some time so you know like I probably reached by 5.30 okay uh, so the second campsite is known as Imudu. Imudu, okay. Imudu, yeah. So I think that's the prettiest campsite, and mm-hmm. I think uh, it's the most prettiest campsite throughout the entire uh, trek, in the entire trek, because you know you have this fairy tale logwood cabin mm-hmm. right in the middle of nowhere. So you are in, you're like up there in the mountains, like you know in a rainforest, and you have this beautiful, very cute logwood cabin. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so yeah so uh, trekkers are so there is one cabin for which like where the trekkers sleep and there's another one which is also a kitchen mm-hmm. made of logwood and the uh, organizers basically they sleep there once the cooking is over and you know, they're wrapped up with everything okay yeah wonderful and uh, how big of a trekking group was this person that you went uh we were 12 uh in total like the trekkers were 12 like okay. i think the organizers were more than us i mean <laughs> I mean, porters, organizers, and everyone together, they were like more than us. Mm. Uh, there was one uh, female, unfortunately, she had to go down after the second camp. So, oh, I think okay. uh, we continued, uh, rest of us, we continued. So, we were 11 who continued to trek and completed mm. the trek. So, one of the, one of the women, like, girls, she, has to, she had to go down. So, that was in 12 initially. But okay. Okay. Uh, and in general, like, uh, how was your overall experience? Obviously, you're uh, trekking through the day and everything, but uh, from a perspective of um, the trekking guides, are they constantly helping you out? Are they, uh, even when you're camped, right, uh, in way of cooking, sharing stories, etc.? Like, how was that overall experience? Because that is also very vital to keeping up your spirits, right? Uh, how, how you're um, kind of 
uh, engaging and uh, spending time with your other truckers and the organizers? Yeah, the organizers were really good, like porters, organizers, the cooks and everyone was like so good because they are really hospitable. Like the hospitality is really good. They're warm yeah. people, like you know. And when you ask them about stories, folklore, and everything, they're so like they're ready to tell you everything. They're ready to share their stories, and they're ready to like you know share their experiences. So I think overall the team was really good. I mean, they were very warm, welcoming, mm-hmm. and uh, I think we all had like a very good time. Like once we reached the campsite, we will all gather around the firewood. Where mm-hmm. the cooking is going on, basically in the kitchen, and we mm-hmm. all would like sit chat. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah, so I had an amazing experience, and like uh, they would make sure that you know each of the trekker is fine. Uh, mm-hmm. They are well fed. <laughs> we are well fed. We've eaten well, and you know, we are all doing fine in terms of like our health. Yeah, um, cool. Now. Um... Second day, you've uh, replenished, uh, had a good fill, uh, spent some time at the, uh, this is the Emudu campsite. And uh, what are we looking at day three or the next day's trek? So for us, the day three was still in Emudu camp because the weather okay. conditions were uh-huh. very bad. Okay. So we basically had to stay one day extra. Like in the beginning, I told like, you know, we had to stretch it for nine days. Mm. Uh, but uh, for us, like the third campsite was, I think that was like the most difficult trekking part, I think, throughout the entire journey, like the, from second to, you know, the third camp. Okay. Uh, and even the campsite was very, very gloomy. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, so you, uh, from like uh, in the third day or like, you know, in our case, it was the fourth day, but let, let's just say third day because generally how mm-hmm. it is. So in the third day, like uh, you have to uh, start trekking uh, through starting from the rainforest. So I think good half an hour is continuing like the rainforest, mm-hmm. and then abruptly like it ends, and you know the Rocky Mountains they start. Oh okay. So there is a little bit of like vegetation out there, but like mostly it's like all mountains. Mm. And I think that day was like the toughest because, you know, you have to use a lot of technical climbing. Oh, okay. So it's just not, you know, walking. So I think that day was pretty tough for me. And if there was one uh, guide who was always there for me, mm-hmm. he was just walking with me, he helped me throughout the entire trek because, you know, it, was, it got really difficult for me at one point to like, you know, keep climbing. Sure. So, yeah, I think that, that day was very tough because uh, it was very, very windy and it was misty. Uh, it was all foggy. Uh, although, like, the lake, you could see the lake, like, on the other side. But, like, because of the fog, we couldn't see it. Uh, and uh, the climb was also very steep. As in, it was not exactly steep, but, like, since it was Rocky Mountain, so, you know, it's like, you have to climb up, then go down, up, down. And it's like big, big leaps you have to take. And yeah. there were a couple of uh, places where you know, it's a perpendicular rock. So, you know, you have to hold on to ropes and like, you know, put your body weight and like climb through that. So there were a lot of like climbing technical uh, things that we learned, like, you know, technical climbing involved mm. uh, from the second to the third camp. And like you reached the third camp. Uh, so when we reached, it was all foggy. It was uh, drizzling mm-hmm. and it was raining. It was like foggy, it was misty. So you couldn't see anything. And uh, the campsite was unfortunately very, very windy. Like, uh, mm-hmm. and it was very gloomy. It was not like the first and the second campsite where, you know, we all were chilling together right. and talking and having fun. It was just like we had our food and we just slept off. Like, you know, we just want to yeah. move on, like, you know, after yeah. this campsite. Yeah, and a much so, tougher uh, trekking day also, right? Like you mentioned, very, very technical. So that way also, I think most of you are uh, yes. very tired because of that trek itself. Um, but yeah, we finally are at, um, I guess, our first lake at this campsite. Yes, or very close the to this first, campsite, yeah. Uh, the first lake is visible from the, uh, the third uh, campsite. Okay. When we reached there, we couldn't see anything. But mm. when we woke up, woke up in the next morning, that's when the fog started clearing a bit. Mm. And that's when we saw our first lake. So basically, to just see the first lake, you'll have to climb two days. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, so you'll have to climb two days just to see the first lake. And then you have like six more lakes remaining. Right, right, right. 
So yeah, well worth the wait. The the first lake. Uh, tell us a little bit more about uh, like uh, what is this lake called and uh, what sort of uh, like all of these are obviously like high alpine lakes. Um, yes. But in terms of the size and everything, like what are you looking at? So the first lake is called as Kamuyu. Mm-hmm. I mean Kamuyu, and uh, since it was a bit foggy, mm. so we couldn't like figure out the color. But generally on a bright sunny day, it looks blue. Since it's in you know the Alpine, the Alpine Lake, so it looks like this kerosene kind of color. Mm-hmm. So we did really spend a lot of time uh, because you can't really go down to the lake. You know, you can just see from like the cliff or probably like just from your campsite. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that lake is basically sandwiched between like two mountains. Ah, oh, I see. You get good yes. views of the lake, but not necessarily very close. You're not very close to the lake. No, I you can't really down. go down to yeah. the lake. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, uh, and I think that's also one of the things. Um, which was stressed upon, um, like obviously in your blog as well as a, a few other accounts I saw of the trek, is making sure that you, one, obviously you're respecting nature and the surroundings and also like not creating too much of a ruckus and uh, right. shouting and all of that, right? Um, because I think the locals are also very particular about that, uh, respecting nature and respecting the mountain gods. Right. right so, uh, yes, the locals, uh, in fact, even our the organizers and like porters, so they are animals to nature, like they mm-hmm. worship nature. Mm-hmm. So, uh, they believe that, you know, they believe in mountain gods. So, mm-hmm. they don't want to upset the mountain god. Mm-hmm. So, they have been telling us like throughout the entire trek, like right from the very beginning, like before, before we started our trek, there was a briefing, like, you know, how to behave in the mountains and uh, what to do and what not to do. So they strictly told us not to create ruckus, not, not to scream mm. or, you know, not to like just go and swim in that lake. Right. <laughs> so don't do it. Because they believe that, you know, if you scream and, you know, if you like create uh, a lot of noise, so that basically upsets the mountain god and that's when, you know, the, the mountain god makes the weather unfavorable for mm. us. Mm-hmm. So there has been instances which, like they said that there has been like instances where, you know, like the weather was clear and everything was fine and then there was a group of trekkers who went bonkers, like they would just jump in the lake and like, you know, they would like have fun, they would scream and suddenly like, you know, there would be like thunderstorm and like there would be all heavy rain. So I think it's just a belief that they have, a spiritual belief. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's a, I mean, definitely, again, uh, one, for your own safety, right, don't yes. uh, indulge in these things. But secondly, also, like, uh, make sure you respect the beliefs of the locals there, right? Because obviously, Absolutely. they're the ones who are making this possible in the first place. A lot of these right. things wouldn't have been possible. So it's best to uh, respect their uh, beliefs as well and uh, just make it like a wholesome experience for everyone, right? Uh, just right. not make it untoward. Um, but yeah, weather can literally turn from um, a blink of an eye, right? It can go from really yeah, nice to really bad. Yeah, weather can so, really change. Uh, yeah. So that was something like five minutes, it would be like sunny and then, you know, it would, might rain and again, it might the sun might come up. So yeah, it was like quite a drastic change in the weather, like very frequently. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So again, drives home the point of being well prepared in terms of your gear and your uh, clothes and uh, the different things you should carry. Uh, Now, uh, in terms of the next day, right, obviously uh, you've gone through the one of the harder days in terms of the trekking and you've uh, made camp close to the first lake, the uh, Kamuyu Lake. And uh, after this, what is the plan for day four? Upasana, like uh, how, how long of a trek is this and comparatively like to the previous day, what type of a trek was this? Camp 4 was also easy, mm-hmm. but uh, from Camp 3 to Camp 4, uh, mm. I think this was the most beautiful trek mm. throughout the entire uh, nine, eight days. Like It was like the most beautiful uh, route. Mm-hmm. So, and it was easy with like gentle slopes and you know, there was this beautiful rolling hills and mm-hmm. you feel like, you know, you are the kind of hills that you see in Scotland or, you know, uh, mm-hmm. if, if you get an idea. So, you know, that kind of landscape was there. So, it was not a very difficult climb. So, once, you know, I think for, I think 15 to 20 minutes, you have to just cross the Rocky Mountain Park mm-hmm. and the uh, slopes and all. And then, you know, it's just a very breezy walk through the rolling hills. So... I think, yeah, the fourth day was, uh, I mean, uh, 
uh, third to fourth camp was pretty easy okay. uh, and beautiful. So, you know, it was like combination of easy and beautiful. So I think this was the day like, you know, you enjoy the most. You had like at leisure, like, you know, because you reach the fourth camp and that is basically the base camp for next uh, so you have the second lake there and mm-hmm. then you know you have like the rest five of the lakes from you'll have to go from there so you you have to like basically stay there for two or three days okay so yeah three three days i think four. okay like the last day you have to climb down so uh, two two nights i think yeah okay four. so this is basically your uh, final campsite for the rest yeah of the trip so you well, know right? you know that you know you're going there you know you can just chill for a while like you know you just don't have to like pack your bags every day again <laughs> climb <laughs> so you can like you know just relax for three days you know like this is the place you're going to stay uh for three days and it's beautiful like i think uh you have like a waterfall mm. which is very close to the campsite mm-hmm. and uh, you have your campsite is basically between two mountains oh, wow. okay. so uh, so you basically call these although it's like foothills of himalayas you can say but you sure. call these as uh mishimi hills yeah although yeah. these are mountains but you call them like they call it mishimi hills so it's basically between two hills and you have a lake right in front of you mm. Okay. Uh, what is this lake? This is Lake Number Two, right? Uh, what yeah, is this called? So it is called Emuya. Emuya mm-hmm. Lake. Okay. Yeah. So uh, you have like a waterfall, and you have like this beautiful stream flowing through this, uh, this like below the waterfall, like just uh, ahead of it. Mm-hmm. And uh, at night, you know, you have this very beautiful lit, starlit sky. Mm-hmm. So I think that camp is very, very beautiful uh, because you know you are like. right in middle of nature like you know you have mountains you have stream you have waterfall you have the sky <laughs> and the lake obviously yeah yeah it's literally like somebody has painted this for you right everything exactly. in one <laughs> exactly and then you know that there's a camping site like uh, i mean like cooking place where you know the uh, organizers they cook and all so mm. you can just sit near the fire fireplace like there's a fireplace like mm-hmm. this is always like running apart from like night when people are sleeping Mm. So you can just sit, chill, and you know you can have like unlimited number of like cups of tea, like li- like the black tea, mm-hmm. and you can just chat with them, talk to them. Uh, I think I had a lot of fun, like in the fourth camp. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And in terms of uh, what the team is cooking and feeding you folks. Uh, uh, I know, obviously, with the nature of the trek, you can't always expect. uh the best of foods and everything but like more from a nourishing and energy refilling you uh, refilling you perspective from that perspective is what we uh, t- take it into account uh, but what were you guys usually eating in the camps so dal was there every day dal mm-hmm. rice mm-hmm. so uh, so dal rice and then sometimes it's soya bean sometimes it's uh, just potato mm. and uh, so they carry a lot of tin fish Oh, so if someone is not a vegetarian if someone is a vegetarian probably mm-hmm. you know they would have very limited option mm-hmm. they would just have to eat like alu or like sort of potato or like pickle mm-hmm. but uh, someone uh, for vegetarians like uh, the option is a bit limited and you mm-hmm. have to just settle down to potato but like non vegetarian because you know north east is again you know very sure. dominated by non veg diet yeah so uh, tin fish is something that was very common like every alternate day, there was tin fish and then there was soya bean mm. uh, potato and then first day i think it was like uh, there was some leafy vegetables mm-hmm. boiled leafy vegetable but i don't know the dal was somehow very very tasty <laughs> and probably it was cooked uh, uh, like right in the fire like in you know, open right. fire and like you know you have this logs burning and they're like just open fire i think probably because of that yeah but some of the dal was really tasty and then you add those tin fish pieces and you know that that was i think delicious for breakfast they would mostly give us bread uh-huh. sometimes maggi and okay. uh, they also had this packet of uh, uh, parathas like i see so flattened bread yeah so uh, yeah they would give that with pickles so yeah, it depends like okay but they fed us really well like you know, i yeah. love the food <laughs> Yeah, I'm sure, uh, especially when you're uh, like I said, all tired with the trekking and everything, the food also tastes uh, extra, extra good, right? <laughs> exactly, and you can't like you know expect yeah, some sure. off the menu <laughs> something yeah. like that. 
Yeah, yeah. Uh, no fine dining here for you, but obviously yeah. something that's more practical. And when you uh, have the nature right yeah. in front of you, I mean, why do you need fine dining? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, and also one common thing that I saw on uh, some of these treks and uh, probably... Um, you also experienced this was uh, a lot of these uh, trekkers and especially the guides and locals they used to carry i think chana right uh, they used to carry chana and uh, just soak it in water along the way and use that almost like a energy drink right they would drink the water and eat the chana that would keep them like um, super f- uh, like it'll it'll be very filling as well uh, that way it'll keep you, help you maintain energy as you're doing the trek as well that was uh, i think something i saw uh, very commonly done by a lot of the locals too so um, now having spent some time here at uh, one of the most beautiful campsites by um, lake emuya uh, what is the plan a plan now for uh, the remaining so we've covered off two of the seven lakes now and um, okay. we're what four days into the trek so how does it four days what, in. yeah what does the plan look like for the rest of the days from here so fifth day like we cover uh, we cover two lakes okay so after breakfast we started our hike uh, at around like let's say 9 8:39 mm-hmm. and uh, we also have to pack something on the way for the right. winter, like so that we can eat something on the way right uh, because it's going to take some time for us to reach back you know so lunch time like so we have basically our lunch like uh, probably close to the fourth lake or you know somewhere on the way wherever you're hungry mm-hmm. <laughs> so so uh third lake is pretty easy to climb i mean it's like uh that route, uh, route is very easy like you don't have to really climb like a lot mm. so the third lake is called as poyumbu lake okay poyumbu. so it's at an altitude of 13500 feet mm-hmm. although you don't have to climb a lot but it's when you walk like when you're walking towards that lake like not towards the lake but you know when, like walking through that route mm-hmm. you have to walk you're walking through a very narrow ridge like it's sort of a scary because you know you see that lake and then you know one misstep in you know there's a chance that you fall down mm. so although it was a very short route and it was not like very uh, steep or something but it was a bit scary because of that part because uh, the ridge was very very narrow okay you don't really spend like a lot of time watching the third lake because you know the fourth lake is i think the highlight of the entire trip uh, okay uh, how so personal like how's it different from the rest of the lakes lake number 4 first of all it's like sandwiched between two mountains and like mm-hmm. it's like the biggest lake okay uh, what's this one called the lake four the fourth lake is called dinu lake dinu okay yeah the reason it's like the best is because uh, i think beauty wise uh the landscape is very very beautiful mm-hmm. the landscape is very beautiful like the color is crystal blue like it's like this gorgeous blue and white lake mm-hmm. you know, and then you have this very grayish kind of mountains because you don't have a lot of vegetation it's like rocky mountains again mm-hmm. so you have like this gray rocky mountains sandwiched in that blue lake and it's very beautiful i can't even explain how it looks <laughs> like you know, <and> then <laughs> So definitely something uh, getting your pictures and everything. I think this is a really nice uh, point to get some great shots. And um, right. uh, the plan was to cover up these two lakes for this day, day four or day five, whatever that is. Yeah. Yeah. The f- okay. And once you're done with like the fourth lake, again, you have to climb down again. Uh, mm. Like climbing down again is exhausting because, you know, sure. uh, that kind of endurance that you put while climbing from lake third to fourth. Yeah. Uh, like... the view points are basically the fourth and uh, because you can't really go close to the lakes it's like down but um that day was fairly like short like you know we we came back to our campsite by like 1 2 and oh, then okay. we had like uh, the this was really chill Yeah, so I think that's, uh, like we mentioned, one of the good things about the last campsite was you just go back there. So even while traveling, you don't have to pack everything, right? You could uh, right. pack light, just stuff to uh, have on the way. Uh, and uh, the next day is probably the last day in terms of uh, going to the yeah. lakes, right? You're covering off everything the next day? Right. So on the seventh day, we have like last three lakes that we have to cover. Yeah. Hmm. So it was a hectic day and we were worried about it. Mm-hmm. So it got a it sort of got me scared because I was the slowest in the entire group. So <laughs> okay. I would literally be the last one crawling and you know managing somehow to reach 
and by the time I reach, people already start leaving. So you know, so yeah. it really got a bit scary for me. But I was like, you know, you have to do it. Like you know, you have come this far, so you have to have to complete it. Mm. Uh, so this day was like uh, the first lake, that like the fifth lake. Mm-hmm. It's called as uh, Cheni Lake. Cheni. Okay. So uh, the fifth lake is known to have some magical powers. Like people believe that you know it mm-hmm. has some magical powers. So earlier, what used to happen was like basically this is a hunting route. Uh-huh. So uh, the Edomishimi tribe, who are native to the Bangali, they would come to the mountains and like they would hunt for different things. A lot of people believe that you know the there's a glow, there's a glow that comes in the lake at midnight. Mm-hmm. And it's because of some magical power that the uh, lake has. Mm. Uh, which is again like some people claim that they've seen something like that. So the, we had like one of our guides with us. Mm-hmm. His father was a hunter. Mm-hmm. And he too was a hunter but like now he has quit hunting. But uh, uh, when his father used to come for hunting and uh, that's when his father saw like they used to take shelters in the caves nearby. From the caves, you can see that the fifth lake. So they say that like there's this glowing light that comes at midnight from that lake, and, and it has like some healing power and like some magical power. Mm. So there were like two guys from the trek who also like they wanted to see if there is something that is mm-hmm. there. So just before that, like when we climbed the fourth and the fifth lake, uh, mm. no, sorry, the third and the fourth lake, there were three mm-hmm. guys who went with one of the guides and they stayed overnight in the caves mm. just to see if there was some some magical power they could see some lights but unfortunately they did not see anything <laughs> okay so yeah it is known to have some mystical power but again mm. we don't really know you know whether it's right. true or it's just folklore and you know sure. based on some people who have seen it yeah very interesting and this is the Cheney Lake you mentioned right Cheney Lake the fifth yeah. lake yeah and uh, after you're done with that, like, you know, you finally summit. So, uh, the final lakes are called as Huhu. Huhu 1 and Huhu 2. So, Huhu. it's like, okay. yeah, Huhu. So, Huhu 1 lake uh, continues and then it falls from one mountain and it continues and it becomes a Huhu 2. So, oh, okay. there are like two lakes which are, you can see the both of the lakes from the same viewpoint. Mm. So, like, 6th and 7th, like, basically... It's a long climb from the fifth lake to the sixth and seventh. So yeah, it forms like from one mountain top to another. So like two lakes are like close to each other. So you know, by the time like uh, I reached the summit, it was raining heavily. Mm-hmm. So I couldn't really spend like a lot of time, and that's when I also started feeling a bit of like altitude sickness. Like I, mm-hmm. I started feeling a bit of. Uh, I was suffering from a bad headache kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I think after spending maybe 20 minutes, you know, mm. uh, we had to make our way down because I was the last one who was there. Mm. Yeah, this is, uh, you're saying, um, I guess between 13 and 14,000 feet also, right? So yeah, probably yeah. one of the reasons. Uh, and also it was a long day, like you said, in terms of, uh, it's pretty packed, right? You're visiting right. literally three lakes that day. And uh, like you mentioned, between uh, Lake 5 and uh, Lake 6 and 7, the distance is also quite a bit. So a lot of things, a lot of factors might have come into play. Uh, but yeah, how was the feeling, uh, <laughs> Upasana? Uh, I mean, yeah, not really a summit in the sense of a summit of a mountain, but in terms of your trek, this is the summit, right? Lake 6, 7. It was an amazing (laughs) feeling because, uh, first of all, like I was not physically fit, right? And uh, you know, it I have been planning to go on this trek like from like the very beginning, from the first time when I really saw, like, because Mm -hmm. I told, uh, like, I I mentioned earlier, right, that this is like a very new trek and it's just been like a year or something that they started conducting the commercial treks, like Mm -hmm. that locals. So ever since I saw these pictures, I really wanted to go. So it was like a very, very happy moment for me. Despite like all the hardship, despite <laughs> all the exertion, like, you know, despite me, like, you know, I thought probably will I be able to do it or not? Because, you know, I was not physically that fit. Like, but since I was in the summit, like, you know, at least the end of the trip. Mm. So I was very, very happy. And sort of like I was also caught in like a lot of emotions because, you know, I felt like I've come so far, like, you know, just to see this and this is it. Yeah, yeah. So I just wanted to like sit there and stare at both of these lakes, like because I knew like you know I'm not coming here again, probably. Yeah, I think this is one of those 
probably a once in a lifetime type of trek slide exactly. it's not very easy and not very accessible um so all of those factors obviously if you'd like to you could go back but uh yeah for more often than not it's going to be once in a lifetime type of experience so yeah definitely does get to you emotionally as well right yeah and i'm glad that you were able to uh complete this almost unscathed i uh, i could say uh, and uh, yeah just so the whole nature of the trek itself right very new very unexplored very raw and it's not uh, overtly commercial like a lot of the other treks so that way the overall experience is also so very different right uh, i think one of the things that uh, was being called out as well was that you will not find even one um, i mean the himachal treks are now becoming so uh kind of uh, mainstream that you find right. little, literally small dhaba type of things right the tapris exactly. from place to place serving you like hot chai and maggi and all of that none of this over here uh, here it's really raw really hardcore where you actually uh, tough tough it out for 7 yeah. 8 days and it's untouched yeah like that's the best part like it's untouched yeah yeah 100% so that way very very unique experience and i'm assuming um probably like after this you're uh, basically retracing your route back right right thanks so much for beautifully explaining uh, all of the like in detail the overall trek the preparations the uh, even the scenes and the sounds and uh, everything that you see around you while you making this trek uh, in terms of the locals of the people as well as uh, i'm sorry in terms of the locals as well as the uh, folklore and the legends associated to this trek or even this place in general right is are there any stories that you heard on the way from the trekking guides that you'd like to share upasna yeah i mean i spoke to my trekking guides a lot uh, mm-hmm. like you know just wanting to know about their culture like you know their beliefs and like uh what stories they have to tell folklore basically so mm-hmm. i really love like listening to that mm-hmm. so yeah like uh, they told me a couple of stories uh, so uh, that also they heard from somewhere like you know like mm-hmm. i earlier mentioned like you know they already warned us like not to scream a lot mm-hmm. not to like you know do something that is uh, harming the nature because right. you know it's like them they have a huge reverence for the mountain gods you know they nothing to disappoint the mountain gods so so there were like couple of stories so there's this one story i don't know whether it's true or not but they said that it's a true story mm-hmm. so uh so they basically respect that pose mm. like Frogs, so uh, that pose is, frogs, yeah, yeah yeah so that pose is something that are not supposed to be harmed mm. and uh, when you are in the fourth lake and throughout the lake like you also see like a lot of that pose and like especially in the fourth uh, camp site mm-hmm. uh, there are these streams like so you see like a lot of that pose so you are not supposed to disturb them at all mm. so there's a story uh, where you know there were a couple of trekkers who went for this trek Uh, so they were like local guys local trekkers mm. and so there was one guy like you know he would kill all that poles and go mm. on the way and the other guy there was the other, like another guy he would not do that mm-hmm. he would just tell him why are you killing the that poles so so he just kept doing that doing that for the entire uh, route mm. so while coming back uh, what happened was there was uh, this moment like you know Uh, when they they both were resting under a tree and suddenly like there's a branch that f- fell mm. and uh, somehow they both escaped mm. and it didn't really hurt anyone now while they were going back they were crossing a stream so like the guy who was actually trying to protect the tadpole he like everyone basically crossed the stream properly even like that guy but the guy who was killing the tadpole while he was crossing mm. suddenly like you know there was this uh, huge uh, stream of water that started coming like you know and then he just got flooded away mm, flooded like, away, like was, yeah, yeah yeah he was like yeah there was a current and like he you know, just like you know he was swept off with the current mm. so yeah i think that is like you know killing the dead pool is like not a good thing it's a bad omen yeah. so that is one folklore mm. uh, about like uh, about the trek mm-hmm. um there are a couple of others like one is basically uh they say that uh, you know there's this story of a hunter and like two frogs so there were like two frogs which are fighting with each other again this is a folklore i'm sure like this is not like a true st- story but mm. it's very interesting to hear like so uh, there was this hunter who went to hunt and then um, 
there were two tent poles that were fighting with each other. So he tried to like separate them, and then there was one tent pole like you know who was about to die. Somehow he nursed that tent pole mm-hmm. uh, to life, and then uh, he was there in the cave, and like he would go hunting during uh, the day, and then come back, and he would see like someone has already kept meals mm-hmm. for him. Mm. So uh, so after that. That would keep happening like the day after day, and then one day he just hid and like he just wanted to know like you know what, who has kept the meals. So there was this woman who actually would come and keep the meals for him. So he asked like, why are you doing this? So she said that she is basically the daughter of the dead pole, mm. and uh, since uh, he saved the life of that uh, not the dead pole but the frog. Mm-hmm. Um, so if, since uh, he saved the life of the frog, that's why you know they are returning the favor and they are helping him out. Mm-hmm. So that is one folklore. So I think there are a couple of others. Like I don't really remember all of them, but mm-hmm. uh, like talking to the guides and the organizers, it was very, very good to like you know know their stories, their beliefs. Yeah, definitely. Uh, again, we have been very, uh, like you mentioned at the beginning, very cut off from a lot of the uh, just the local tribes and their practices and mm-hmm. everything. Right? We have just been so. Uh, and aware of all of them so it's really good to just get a, hear a lot of these stories uh, like i mentioned all of these are folklore but definitely right. it's it's uh, good to know and uh, basically these are the mishmi folk right they're called as the yeah uh, mishmi tribes yeah this one in specific is idu mishmi there's also the miju mishmi i think that's the other yes. um, tribe as well right there's right. A, a lot of uh, very unique uh, practices traditions very right. interesting uh, culture overall so for somebody to um, learn about that know about that is also very interesting and i'm sure some of the um, the local guides would be from those tribes right the tribesmen so yeah all all of the guides yeah were in mishmi and they have like amazing really interesting festivals and yeah. like the food is delectable yeah yeah so not on the trek but if you make another trip uh, around the around the region uh, it'll be a good opportunity to interact with a lot of these uh, tribes as well and learn a lot more about them but uh, thank you so much upasna we really really like to thank you for uh, taking us on this uh, wonderful journey although vicariously but you so beautifully laid it out for us right from the uh, different sites and the scenes one goes through from grasslands to rolling hills to rainforests to rocky mountains and getting a view of these uh, wonderful literally magical alpine lakes i would say right uh, and also these folklore that are associated with them it's just like icing on top of the cake it just makes the overall experience so so wholesome thank you for sharing that wonderfully with us we'll make sure to include uh, not just the social handles of uh, opasna but also a link to the blog so people can check it out and yeah we'll 100% make sure that we include the pictures because uh, this is only half of it what we're speaking to obviously being and doing the trek is the real deal but at least the pictures will give you a little more insight into uh, what the real and raw beauty of arunachal of the bang valley and the seven lakes trek is thank you so much opasna once again for being on the musafir stories podcast thank you so much <laughs> That was yet another great episode on the Musafir stories. Make sure to show us some love by sharing the podcast with your friends and family. We are on Instagram and Twitter at Musafir stories. If you like this podcast, don't forget to check out other interesting podcasts on the IVM network. You can listen to us on the IVM podcast app or the website. Follow us on our social media. We are at IVM podcasts on Twitter and Instagram. Thank you.